In this video I'm going to answer some of the questions about the accuracy and performance of my CNC router machine. The most common question I get is, can it cut aluminium? This question alone isn't a good measure of accuracy. The quick answer is yes, but I must admit I even managed to cut aluminium with the x car when I still had one. The real question is, can it cut aluminium well? Can it cut anything well? This machine can cut material better than any belt or lead screw driven machine I've used. The other question is, can it cut aluminium all day, all week, and all month? And the answer to that question is, I don't think so. I'd imagine the machine would either rattle itself apart, or the tool would overheat. The thing is, to cut aluminium over long periods of time, you need flood coolant or a lubricating mist, which would make a massive mess. You'd have to cut smart, using drilling tool paths instead of milling where possible, and countless other things. While this machine is the most rigid I've built, and I'd happily describe it as an advanced hobbyist machine, it's not a mill. You don't need a concrete floor to sit this thing down. So how do we measure accuracy and performance? These are the parameters that come to mind. Travel accuracy, backlash, squareness, deflection, and repeatability. Travel accuracy. Do the axes move the distance we require? For example, if I instruct the machine to move forward along the y-axis 50 millimeters, what is the actual physical measurement? Backlash. What is the tolerance when changing direction along an axis? If I now move backwards along the y-axis, what amount is subtracted from the returning distance? Squareness. Are the axes perpendicular to one another? How similar will a physical shape be to the one designed in CAD? Deflection. How much force is needed and by how far will the spindle bend along a given axis? Will a drilling tool path produce a hole perfectly round throughout the depth of the cut? Repeatability. Will the machine move back to a known location consistently? If I cut a second shape at another position and orientation on the wasteboard, will it be identical to the first? I'm going to try address these constants in measuring accuracy and performance on a CNC machine. Here goes. The first thing I did while setting up the machine was to square the X and Y axis. I have two proximity sensors for either Y axis steppers. I would home the machine and measure the distance between the Y plate and the plates holding their respective proximity sensors using a vernier caliper. I would then fine adjust the proximity sensor using the locking nut until there was under 0.5 millimeters of difference. I then further adjusted the remaining distance using the homing offset in code, measuring after rehoming to check that it was applied correctly. Once that was done, I checked the z-axis was also square and any nod caused by the overhanging weight of the spindle was compensated for. To be honest, much of that was achieved in the machine assembly process, but to double check, I first used my large engineer square to check the x-carriage plate along the y-axis and then the z-axis rail profile along the x-axis. I also placed a 6mm tool with a small cutting face upside down in the collet so I could hold up an engineer square to the shaft. I measured this against the X and Y axis, holding a light behind the tool and square to check for light bleeding. There's a small amount of maneuverability if I need to make corrections. To pivot the spindle back along the Y axis, I can loosen the machine screws holding the Y plates to the rail carriage blocks and the ball screw nut. To pivot along the X axis, I'll need to loosen the machine screws holding the Z axis rail profile through the X carriage plate, which are axis from the rear. The final test involves spot marking four points on the wasteboard. The points need to be the four corners of a square. I can then measure diagonally between them, and if they are the same, that means the earlier calibration was successful. I carefully circle and dab the spot mark points with a pencil to make locating easier. After moving the gantry out my way, I use a steel ruler to measure diagonally between opposite points. 
I'm getting 509 millimeters from either measurement, so the earlier calibration was successful. If I want more accuracy, I could use a beam compass with pin locators, tighten along the beam where the points were located in the impressions on the wasteboard. I could then move the assembly to the other diagonal to check if they line up, but I don't have a beam compass. Here I'm checking my measurements against the CAD drawing, and as you can see they're pretty good. Deflection is hard to measure because it's a combination of movement and force needed to create that movement. But you may notice it while drilling smaller diameter holes where there isn't enough time for the tool to remove material from the cut while plunging. In this case the tool may lift upwards and drop into the cut along the nod, making the entry look a little oval. I'm checking the deflection of the spindle using a dial gauge indicator pressed and zeroed on the collet's inner cone. If I rotate the collet the run out is minimal and if I then push the top of the spindle assembly by hand I can see the distance moved on the dial indicator. There's some twist in the assembly although naturally the Y axis is a lot worse than the X. You're looking at just over half a millimeter along the Y and 0.1 along the X. There's not much you can do with the Y deflection other than recutting some of the plates in aluminium or building some additional bracing for the gantry. But providing you're sensible with your feeds while cutting, you won't notice this in your finished pieces. I might also add this looks a lot worse as the entire machine is moving because its stand is on caster wheels. The first thing I noticed moving to a ball screw was the steps per millimetre became a round hole number, which wasn't the case with previous belt or lead screw machines. This sum was based on the distance the nut block travelled per rotation and the micro stepping settings on the driver. I can then confirm the movement accuracy in a few different ways. I can move along the X or Y axis to check the travel accuracy using a dial gauge indicator. I can place a V-bit in the collet and move the tool along a steel ruler, comparing the point of the tool to the increment on the ruler after moving from a known location. I could also cut a shape out and measure it using a digital vernier caliper. I noticed that my x-axis was a little more off than my y-axis and realised I hadn't fully tightened the locking nut on the FK12 fixed support. To tighten this up I used a boa strap to hold the motor coupler while tightening the nut. I made sure the nut was fitted the correct orientation with the flat ground face pressing against the bushing. And I also replaced the small grub screw with a larger socket head screw so I could get better purchase while tightening its final position. You can see the difference here. Unfortunately, backlash isn't something you can fully eliminate without preloading the nuts which run along the ball screws. For my purposes the mount found with these screws is small enough to not cause a real problem with the type of things I'll be cutting. Some controllers have backlash compensation features built in, but this is not the case with either the Duet or Gerbil. Also be aware if the FK12 locking nut isn't fully tightened as mentioned previously, this may appear as backlash. You can see the backlash here is pretty small. Coming back to the deflection and the spindle nod, I decided to check the Y plates themselves to measure the deflection along the Y axis from front to back. And as you can see, it's a lot less than when I measured from the spindle collet. I'm trying to imagine where this additional deflection is coming from and I think it's the aluminium profile twisting. I'm going to cut a brace to bolt to the rear of the X axis to see if that makes any difference. I could also adapt the Y plates in future to use square 40x40 40 40 profile, which will provide additional rigidity. I designed and tooled this part in Vectric Software Spire, and as you can see, it's cutting pretty well without the brace, but Velcromat is quite a forgiving material. I'm using a 4mm single flute up spiral cutting bit from Europa Tools. My pass steps is 4mm, feed rate is 1200mm a minute, Rapid movement is 1800 millimeters a minute. Plunge rate is 700 millimeters a minute. The spindle speed is 21,000 RPM and the machine acceleration is 60 millimeters per second squared. I think it's important to mention the machine acceleration because that really determines the final speed. This job took about 12 minutes to cut out. After it finished, I used a sharp chisel to cut the tabs from the model and then I fixed it to the rear of the X-axis using socket head machine screws and dropping T-nuts. <laughs> 
I can then repeat the experiment and it looks like I've shaved about 0.2 of a mil off the deflection along the y-axis. The brace also acts as a plaque for the name of the machine, which I'm now calling Moot1. Let me know if you like the name, if you think it's catchy. It's taken me quite a while to come up with a decision. The next thing to do is to check the repeatability. I'm going to cut two identical shapes at two different locations and orientations on the wasteboard and compare them. I'm cutting two squares, one with its sides parallel to the X and Y axis and the other rotated at 45 degrees. Essentially one shape will cut with one axis and its associated steppers moving at a time, while the other shape requires both the X and Y axis to move simultaneously. You've got to imagine these two shapes use two entirely different cutting methods. It's as different as trying to make a circle with a compass and with a two-point elliptical jig. Or to put it another way, drawing two identical squares on an Etch-a-Sketch where you use one dial at a time to draw the first, but need to use both dials simultaneously for the second. Thinking about it, I could have used this method with the spot marking test earlier, but here we'll get to see how cutting affects the final pieces as well. There is an overall difference of less than 0.1 millimeters. That's as good as I can hope for, and a really good indicator of the overall squareness and the machine's ability to cut repeatable shapes across the wasteboard. I'm really happy with this, and the last thing I need to do is resurface or flatten the wasteboard. I do this with a 22mm two flute flat bit cutting 0.5mm into the wasteboard. The tool step over is set to 85% which is roughly 90mm and the feed rate is 1800mm a minute. I use a conventional offset tool path which means the tool spirals and includes movements across and along the wasteboard. The advantage of this method is that if the spindle and its tool are still not entirely square I'll be able to see signs of this on the wasteboard. It's barely noticeable, but if I run my fingers across the wasteboard or look carefully from a particular angle, I can tell that the spindle is off by a tiny fraction of a degree counterclockwise along the x-axis, and there's a nod present along the y at a similar mount. In the manual I'm writing for this machine, I use a different spindle mount, which you can see over here. It's not as clunky as the other, and I think it'll be easy to get that final calibration down with that, possibly shimming the spindle itself around 0.2 or 0.3 of a mil. Anyway, this video has lasted long enough and I'm going to end it here. I hope it's been useful and you find some interesting techniques within it to help you with your projects. I'm still not sure when this manual will be ready, but when it is, I'll link to it everywhere. Thanks again for watching, to my patrons for their continued support, and you'll catch me in the next one.